so let me start with the broad goal for this talk. Uh, so we are interested in developing generic mechanisms uh, to improve uh, the efficiency of indistinguishability, indistinguishability of a scission. And this is uh, basically motivated by the fact that, that by now we have a lot of theoretical applications of I.O. And uh, the efficiency of all of those applications basically depend upon uh, the efficiency of I.O. And therefore, it motivates the goal of uh, improving the efficiency of I.O. in a generic manner. Um, so let me start with a very, very brief overview of the main lines of research in, uh, in indistinguishability of obfuscation. And uh, one of the primary lines of research here is about constructing uh, indistinguishability of obfuscation for general uh, circuits. And by now, there's a lot of uh, work in this area uh, where the main motivation is to get better and better security based on weaker and weaker assumptions. Okay? So while this is still a very active uh, line of research, a parallel line of research uh, which has been going on is about improving uh, the efficiency of I.O. And here I will just focus on uh, the line of research which concentrates on uh, uh, obfuscating uh, more efficient representations of programs, for example, uh, Turing machines. Um, and for example, starting with the work of Betansky et al., by now we have some, uh, some schemes that show how to obfuscate Turing machines uh, directly without the overhead of first transforming them to circuits uh, by only relying upon uh, I.O. for circuits. Okay? And uh, one of the main advantages uh, of, this, of these works is that uh, they achieve per input running time as opposed to the worst case running time uh, on inputs that is inherent in the circuit model. Okay? Um, one uh, caveat of these works is that uh, the correctness only holds uh, for inputs of some a priori bounded length. Okay? And um, uh, while in this talk I'll only focus on uh, IO for Turing machines, let me mention that there are also uh, lots of important works uh, that uh, extend uh, these results further to the regime of uh, obfuscating RAM programs. Um, but uh, here I'll only uh, talk about Turing machines. And in particular, our goal here is to construct obfuscation of Turing machines with uh, better efficiency. So let me actually uh, elaborate what I mean by better efficiency. So in particular, we are interested in two problems. Uh, the first problem is about uh, size efficiency. Um, so we are interested in comparing the size of the obfuscated program relative to the size of the unobfuscated program. Okay. So if we look at uh, the, uh, the results so far, uh, they incur polynomial overhead in the size of the underlying program. That is, the size of the obfuscation of uh, some program M is uh, polynomial in the security parameter, the size of the program M, and some uh, uh, parameter L, which denotes the length of the, uh, the upper bound on the input length. And what we want is uh, constant overhead. That is, we want that the size of the obfuscated uh, program should only be constant times the size of the underlying program M, and some additive overhead in the sec additive polynomial overhead in the security parameter, and again the input length bound L. Okay. And uh, uh, while we are studying this question for the case of Turing machines, this question is already quite interesting for the case of circuits. And in that case, uh, the work of Bitansky and Vakunathan actually showed how to resolve this problem. Uh, the second problem that we are interested in is uh, that of amortization. So let me explain what I mean. Um, so let's say that we are given an uh, indistinguishable of a scalar uh, for circuits of some fixed, a priori fixed size. Okay? And now uh, somebody comes and tells us that uh, they want to obfuscate some polynomial number of Turing machines where this polynomial could be arbitrary. Okay? So the question is, how many invocations of the underlying indistinguishability of a scalar do I need to make in order to obfuscate all of these Turing machines? In particular, can we obfuscate all of them with uh, less than n uh, invocations of the underlying indistinguishability of a scalar? And ideally, we want to go as small as possible. Okay, so that's the question of amortization. Okay, so uh, before stating our results, let me mention that if you actually pause for a moment and think about uh, both of these questions, they will be, you'll, you'll see that they are quite easy to realize if you were given I.O. for Turing machines uh, that supports uh, inputs of unbounded length. Okay, so you can, uh, you can verify this on your own. Um, however, presently such I.O. schemes are not known from uh, I.O. for circuits. Basically, the only way we know how to achieve I.O. for Turing machines with unbounded input length are either by using the stronger notion of uh, differing input sophistication or a weaker version of it called uh, public coin differing input sophistication, or an, uh, another notion called uh, output compressing randomized encodings. 
but uh, none of these uh, primitives are, uh, are known to be realizable from uh, indistinguishable deobfuscation. And uh, our goal is to build, achieve uh, both of these problems, uh, solve both of these problems by using IO for circuits, okay? So that brings me to our result statement. Uh, so our first result is uh, IO for Turing machines with the constant multiplicative overhead where the constant is uh, simply two. Uh, the assumptions uh, are sub-exponentially secure IO for circuits and uh, re-randomizable encryption scheme. Uh, the second result is uh, that we achieve IO for Turing machines with amortization, uh, in fact, the best possible amortization, where uh, if we want to obfuscate some polynomial number of Turing machines, uh, then we can obfuscate them all by only making one invocation to an uh, IO for circuits whose size is a priori fixed. Okay? And uh, the size of the underlying circuit family only depends on uh, the security parameter and the input length bound L that we assume for all the Turing machines. Okay? And the assumptions in this result are the same as the previous one. Okay, so let me now uh, go over uh, some of our techniques. And um, in this talk, I'll primarily focus on uh, the uh, the first result that is achieving uh, I.O. with the constant overhead. So towards that, let's first uh, briefly recap uh, how, how do we build I.O. for Turing machines presently. What is the current template that is followed uh, in, in existing works? Um, so these works basically uh, use two ingredients to build I.O. for Turing machines. Uh, the first ingredient is uh, I.O. for circuits, a general purpose uh, uh, indistinguishable obfuscator. And the second ingredient is uh, uh, a randomized encoding for Turing machines. And this is really the, the hard part of these constructions. Uh, I'm not going to discuss how these uh, things are constructed, but, uh, but if we are given both of these ingredients, this is how you can obfuscate uh, Turing machines. So the idea is as follows. Suppose we want to obfuscate a Turing machine M. Then we take uh, indistinguishability obfuscation for the following circuit. Uh, this circuit has the machine M hardwired inside it together with a PRF key, okay? Upon receiving an input X uh, for the machine M, this indistinguishability of a skater internally computes a randomized encoding of the machine M together with the input X, and the randomness uh, that it uses for this computation is derived from the PRF. And then using this randomness, it, out it computes and outputs a fresh uh, randomized encoding of the machine M together with the input X, and the decoding algorithm is public, so upon receiving this, any evaluator can simply decode and obtain the output M of X, okay? So that's the, the current template. Uh, so I want to now uh, uh, point out the main bottlenecks uh, that this template presents towards achieving uh, the first goal, which is uh, a, a constant overhead, okay? So if you look at this uh, template, you'll notice that the first bottleneck is that uh, since machine M is already embedded inside the circuit, then if we want to achieve constant overhead, we already need to start with uh, a circuit obfuscation scheme which achieves constant overhead, okay? But an even bigger bottleneck is that uh, because the encoding algorithm of the randomized encoding is also embedded inside the circuit, we in fact need even, even stronger property, right? We require that uh, the randomized encoding scheme is such that, uh, that its running time only incurs a constant overhead in the size of the Turing machine M. And this is uh, an extremely hard uh, problem to solve. In fact, even for classical primitives such as encryption schemes, we only know how to achieve uh, constant overhead in running times uh, only using non-standard assumptions, okay? So, so these are kind of the main bottlenecks. Um, that uh, one faces when trying to, you know, extend this, uh, this template towards achieving our goals. And um, let me mention one more point, that if you, if you look at uh, this template, there's some, there's some redundancy here, right? The machine M is basically encoded every time you want to evaluate it on, this, on some input, right? It would be nice if we could just keep bring out the machine M outside of this obfuscation and encode it only once. And uh, this is kind of what we do, and it turns out this is, in fact, the key to achieving our goals, okay? So let me now present our new template, which is kind of the main point of this work, um, a new template for obfuscating Turing machines, which also turns out to be uh, very useful for achieving both of our goals, okay? So the new template is as follows. Uh, in order to obfuscate a Turing machine M, uh, we basically use two ingredients. The first ingredient is IO for circuits, which is as before. The second one, I put a question mark there because I want to basically uh, derive what are the properties that we would want from the second ingredient, okay? 
So let's first focus on the on I/O for circuits. So we use I/O for circuits uh, to basically obfuscate some kind of input encoder, okay, which just takes some input X for the machine M and outputs some encoding of this input. Okay? And in particular, this input encoder is independent of uh, the Turing machine M. Okay? So therefore, the I/O for circuits does not operate on the machine M at all. Okay? And uh, now, if we look together at this uh, encoding of X and the encoding of the machine, we want this to basically rec represent a randomized encoding. Okay? And because they are encoding, encoded separately, this is basically a decomposable randomized encoding. Uh, moreover, since the machine M is only encoded once, okay, overall, therefore, we want this uh, randomized encoding to have a reusability property, right? That it should be possible to reuse the encoding of M uh, many times for evaluating different inputs, okay? And finally, uh, we want that uh, we should be able to construct such a, a reusable randomized encoding without using I.O., right? That's kind of the point. And uh, in order to, for example, achieve our first goal of constant overhead, we would want to construct such a reusable decomposable RE with the constant overhead. Okay? So, so that turns out to be the key, uh, the key co uh, technical contribution of the work. Um, so, uh, so in order to go there, let me first uh, elaborate on this notion, the reusable decomposable RE. Okay. As, as uh, probably you're familiar, when working with I.O., we always need to typically modify the, uh, the notions uh, to make them I.O. friendly. Okay. And this is basically our first step to formalize a notion of reusable decomposable RE, uh, which is uh, friendly towards I.O., uh, facilitates security proofs. Okay. And this is what we call uh, oblivious uh, evaluation encodings. So uh, to explain this notion, let's look at the setting uh, where we have Alice with input uh, X and uh, some bit B. And we have Bob who has two machines, M0 and M1. And we want that uh, somehow, uh, given some uh, encodings, uh, an evaluator Eve should be able to compute M sub B of X. And uh, we want uh, that the evaluator should not be able to learn which of the two machines was used to actually compute the output Z. Okay? So the notion of uh, oblivious evaluation encodings basically resolves uh, this problem where we have some kind of setup uh, which is used to generate some secret key and there the secret keys are given to Alice and Bob. Using the secret key, Alice can encode the input X together with the bit B and uh, Bob can encode uh, the machines M0 and M1. And now when the uh, evaluator receives both of these encodings, then he can run some uh, decoding operation to learn MB of X, okay? So here is uh, basically the syntax, which just, uh, you know, uh, states uh, a bit more precisely what I just said. Uh, there's a setup algorithm, which outputs a secret key, a Turing machine encoding algorithm, uh, an input encoding algorithm, and then finally uh, the decoding algorithm. Okay. So this so far is very similar to a standard reusable randomized encoding scheme, except that you know, we are encoding two machines instead of one, and we are encoding a bit together with the input. Right? So so far, it's not really much different from a reusable randomized encoding. Uh, the main thing that separates this notion from the existing notion is really these uh, two uh, algorithms that I'll mention. Uh, but before that, let me just say that the notion of constant overhead in this setting basically means that uh, if you look at the Turing machine encoding, uh, then you want that uh, the size of this Turing machine encoding is simply constant times uh, the size of the machines M0 and M1 plus some polynomial in the security parameter, okay? So here are the two uh, algorithms that I was alluding to. Uh, the first algorithm is uh, an algorithm that allows you to compute punctured keys, okay? And the keys can be punctured on any input, uh, any point X in the input space. And uh, correctness says that uh, if you give me a, a key that is punctured at point X, then you can still use it to encode any other point in the space, okay, uh, with respect to bit zero or bit one, okay, uh, both of them actually. And security property basically says that even if you are given this uh, punctured key, and then if I give you an encoding uh, on that punctured point X with respect to bit zero, or an encoding of that point X with respect to bit one, you cannot decide which one was given to you, okay? And even if I give you some extra information, uh, let's ignore that for now. The second uh, auxiliary algorithm is basically uh, puncturing on the bit instead of uh, on the input, okay? So the key can now also be punctured on the bit, 
And uh, correctness will say that if I puncture, if I give you a key that is punctured at bit b, then you can use it to encode any input with respect to bit one minus v. Okay. And uh, security property will say that uh, if I give you, for example, uh, the key punctured at uh, bit one, then you cannot distinguish uh, if I give you an encoding of M0, M0, or M0, M1, okay? So because the key that is punctured at bit one, you know, will not allow you to, in, you know, compute the output with respect to the second machines, M0 and M1, therefore you cannot distinguish. Okay. Um, so given that notion, uh, let's just assume for now that we know how to construct it. Um, and let's just see how we can use oblivious evaluation encodings to construct uh, IO for Turing machines uh, with constant overhead. So the construction is quite simple. Um, let's say we want to obfuscate a Turing machine M, then we'll have the two ingredients. The first one will be uh, an IO for circuits, uh, where the circuit basically uh, takes any input X and uh, computes an encoding of that, uh, of that input with respect to the uh, OE scheme. And the second uh, ingredient is simply uh, Turing machine encoding of the machine M, just repeated twice, okay? And uh, the first component is in independent of the machine M, and uh, the second component, uh, since we start from a scheme which has constant overhead, uh, therefore uh, the resulting scheme will also have then constant overhead. So pictorially it looks like this, we start with some input X, and then compute an encoding of X with respect to the bit zero. And then we take these two encodings together, we decode it, and we get M of X, okay? And uh, very, very quickly, the way we do the security proof is as follows. Uh, so we want to argue indistinguishability of uh, obfuscation of M zero from obfuscation of M one. So the first step is to simply switch from encoding uh, uh, M zero, M zero to M zero, M one. And here we use uh, the bit puncturing key. Then we do the standard IO gymnastics, you know, which uh, people are familiar with by now, uh, <coughs> namely positional IO techniques uh, from the works of Gentry et al., where uh, we switch from computing on M0 to computing at, on M1, one input at a time. And here we use uh, the input puncturing key. At the end, only M1 is being used for computation, so now we can switch from M0, M1 to M1, M1, again using the bit puncturing key. So, you know, I do not expect you to understand all this proof, but basically the point was just to show that the notion OE was, you know, pretty much tailored to work with IO, you know, to facilitate the security proof with IO, okay? It was a natural extension of the notion of reusable randomized encoding uh, to facilitate the security proof, okay? And now uh, let me just briefly uh, go over how we construct uh, an oblivious evaluation encoding scheme with the constant overhead. Um, so we follow a two-step approach. Uh, the first step is to construct uh, attribute-based encryption uh, for Turing machines with the uh, constant overhead. And uh, the second step is to then compile it into an OE scheme while preserving the, the efficiency properties. And uh, in fact, the attribute-based encryption scheme that we need is only single key. So we only need security for a single, uh, function, a single attribute key. And uh, in this talk, I'll just skip the second step, just uh, talk briefly about the first step of constructing a B scheme uh, for Turing machines. So here is a quick uh, recap of what, are, what is an attribute-based encryption scheme. Um, uh, there is some setup algorithm which generates a public key, a master secret key. The, uh, uh, the encryptor can encrypt using the public key any, uh, any, uh, any message X together with the, any, any uh, label X together with some secret message and then uh, the, the other entity, Bob, can use the master secret key to compute uh, a, a secret key uh, tied to some machine M. And then given the secret key and the ciphertext, uh, the evaluator can learn the message, uh, the secret message, only if the evaluation of the machine M on input X is one, okay? And again, uh, the notion of constant overhead here can be suitably defined, okay. So in order to construct uh, an attribute-based encryption scheme for Turing machines with constant overhead, our starting point is really uh, this uh, work of uh, Copula et al., which has driven a lot of, uh, you know, subsequent works in this area. Um, and uh, I'll just talk about uh, one of their uh, main results, which is uh, constructing message hiding encodings. Uh, if you're not familiar with the, this notion of message hiding encodings, you can just think of them as very similar to randomized encodings, except that here we encode the machine M, uh, a label X, and a secret message. 
and uh, the evaluator learns the message only if m of x is equal to 1. Okay? So at a high level, this is what their construction looks like. So there is some uh, work tape which is initialized uh, with the input. And uh, we construct some uh, storage tree on top of this uh, work tape using something called uh, position accumulators. Uh, you don't need to know what exactly it is. And then uh, once we have the root, then we construct, uh, then we compute a signature on it, again using some IO friendly notion of signatures. Okay. There is a second component uh, to this construction, which is an obfuscated uh, next message function of the Turing machine M. Uh, um, that we wanted to, uh, for which we wanted to compute an MHE. And uh, this uh, obfuscated next message function also has the message inside it together with a key pair. The key pair that is used to compute this uh, spreadable signature on the root. Okay. And uh, finally, there is also uh, a, a counter which maintains the current state, and it's initialized to the zero state. And the evaluation works in a very natural way. Uh, you, you start with the first memory location, you know, you read it, uh, you take the path from the leaf to the root, the signature on the root, and then, you know, feed it to the obfuscated program. The obfuscated program will verify everything, compute the next step, and then uh, compute the new root and output it together with the new signature. And then the evaluator can update this, uh, this entire storage tree on its own, and then, you know, continue this uh, computation on and on. And finally, at some point, if it hits the accept state, then this obfuscated, uh, you know, program should output the secret message. Okay. And um, the security proof for this construction is, again, you know, uh, follows a pattern which, uh, uh, you know, people who work in uh, IO literature are familiar with, where you have some sets of hybrids, and uh, in the i sets set of the hybrids, the computation of the machine M of X is authenticated at uh, the i step of the computation of machine M is authenticated, and nothing else uh, can be verified by the obfuscated program. And, uh, just keep that in mind uh, when I uh, mention the main, uh, the main issue in extending this idea to the AB setting. And basically, we have uh, two challenges here. The first challenge is that in uh, machine hiding encoding, the machine and the, and the input X are encoded together, whereas in an attribute-based encryption scheme, by definition, we are, we are required to encode them separately. Um, the second issue is that, again, in a machine hiding encoding, uh, the encoding cannot be reused, right? It's a one-time uh, system, whereas in an attribute-based encryption scheme, uh, it's a reusable system, right? So the attribute keys uh, for a machine can be reused. So handling the first issue of decomposability actually turns out to be easy. There is already a natural separation in uh, the construction of, uh, of Coppola et al. in that uh, the, the input X is encoded separately and the machine M is encoded separately. Uh, the only weird thing is that the, the message is actually encoded with the, the machine, whereas what we would want is to encode the message together with the input X. Right? So this is kind of easy to do. Let's just flip the roles of the machine and the input right? by using a universal Turing machine. And now this, uh, the work tape will be initialized with the Turing machine M, and it will correspond to our ABE key. And the obfuscated program, uh, which has the input and the message, will correspond to the ABE ciphertext. Okay? So decomposability was easy to deal with. Uh, the main challenge actually turns out to be achieving uh, reusability, and I won't have uh, time to explain too much, but really the main point is that uh, in the proof of, uh, of their construction, uh, the point is that uh, at some point you have to do, you know, puncturing, right, which is kind of the common step in all I.O. proofs, and uh, the way puncturing is done in their proof is that the verification key for the signature scheme is punctured in such a manner that it only authenticates the i-th step of the computation of m of x and nothing else, okay? And this is okay if you were computing just on one input, right? However, in our case, we want to compute on multiple inputs. Right? So once you have punctured the verification key with respect to a single computation, it becomes incompatible with other computations, and therefore it doesn't quite work anymore. And um, to resolve this problem, we introduce an idea called uh, syn syn signature synchronization, and uh, this is just a quick pictorial representation of it, where basically what we do is that uh, in each AB ciphertext, we actually use fresh signature uh, keys, 
So in every ciphertext, we use a fresh key pair for the splittable signature scheme, um, whereas the AB key actually uses some fixed master uh, signing key to sign the root. And now in order to ensure correctness, we have, uh, we, in each of the AB ciphertexts, we also provide something that we call the translator, which basically transforms signatures with respect to the master signing key into signatures with respect to the key pair that's embedded inside the AB ciphertext. And, um, I won't mention how it is uh, actually implemented, but this is really the, the main, the heart of the construction. And uh, finally, how, how do we achieve constant overhead? Uh, that actually turns out to be easy once we have done all this. Uh, basically, the main issue here is uh, the AB key, right? And uh, the AB key consists of uh, this work tape and the storage tree, right? And of course, this as such might not have constant overhead, and uh, to, to address this point, we just observed that the evaluator actually does not, you know, need to store the, the storage tree. He can just compute the storage tree on its own, right? And therefore, we can just delete the entire storage tree, right? We just have the, the, the description of the machine M and the signature on it, right? And this is our new AB key, and this can have a constant overhead. And uh, that's actually it. <laughs>